Right, uh, welcome to the first video here. This uh, is just a very short, hopefully a short, introductory um, video on our basic Ricardian model, which we're going to look at in the first uh, few videos. At this stage, all we're going to do in this video is uh, set up the concept. It's very simple. A lot of it is actually a bit of its revision from, I'm sure, previous units you've done. And uh, then just set up the essential um, diagram, if you like, that we're going to add to in subsequent um, subsequent videos. Okay, so this is at the moment what we're going to be looking at in a minute is a one-factor model without trade. So all of this video, there's no international trade. We're going to bring that in shortly. A key concept that I know you're aware of, but it's really important, obviously, in trade. So we need to talk about it a little bit. It's opportunity cost. We teach this from the first week almost, I guess, of, of first year. But the, the idea of opportunity cost is so central to trade, both trade between individuals, but also trade between um, countries, that we, we need to have, make sure that you've got a, um, a full grasp of what it is. Because you must be so smart. So an example, we've got the Beebster. Now apparently, I didn't know this, but uh, this is true. He is a great lawnmower. Here's his house. He can mow his lawn in two hours. That's pretty good. Big space here. Anyway, awesome house. Good for Justin. However, in the time that it takes him to mow the lawn, the two hours, he could film a commercial and make $100,000. Actually, he'd probably make loads more than that, but let's just... Pluck out a number, $100,000. So in other words, Justin's opportunity cost of mowing his lawn is 100000 In the time it takes him to mow his lawn, he could have been doing his thing and uh, dancing around and singing and making $100,000. So this is opportunity cost. Let's think about Justin's neighbour, Scotty. Sexy Scotty. Now... He's not as good as mowing at mowing lawns. He it takes him four hours. If he were to mow Justin's lawn, it would take him four hours. Alternatively, instead of mowing Justin's lawn for four hours, he could work at McDonald's, and he could make fifteen dollars an hour at McDonald's. Scotty's opportunity cost of mowing the lawn is, of course, four times fifteen, sixty dollars. So who's better at mowing the lawn? Well, the Beebster is, of course. He can do it in two hours rather than four. He has what we call an absolute advantage in mowing the lawn. Who has a comparative advantage in mowing the lawn? Well, of course, it's Scotty because he can do it at a lower opportunity cost. And remember, that's the key to, um, uh, in terms of trade, is this idea of comparative and not absolute advantage. So uh, the gains here, of course, is that rather than mow the lawn, Justin pays Scotty. Now I've said here it's about $100, but basically it's anything greater than $60 and less than $100,000. So anywhere in between there, then uh, the Beebster can pay Scotty that amount of money. He'll mow his lawn. He'll The Beebster will film his commercial and both will be better off. Scotty will make more than he does at McDonald's and Justin Bieber will make more, obviously, than if he had of mowed his lawn. So that's the idea about specialisation, the gains from trade and comparative advantage. Now many of you again would know but just some background here that uh, Ricardo was the first to sort of um, come up with this idea or at least synthesise this idea into a sort of a cohesive story um, at the start of the 19th century. So this is you know, roughly 200 years ago. The key to this is, well, there's two things actually. Number one, that we're on, hang on, let me get my pen, is that this is a supply side issue in terms of the production of goods and services, but also stresses the idea of labour productivity, about the time, if you like, that it takes a person to be able to produce a unit of the good. So it's really the differences in technology between trading partners that it can account for trade. Now, what does this, this this sort of Ricardian model of trade do? 
Well, first of all, it allows us to look at <clears throat> or gives us an explanation of the origins, uh, origins of trade. So this is the idea, if you like, of um, comparative advantage. Gives us an explanation of the pattern for trade. Who will produce what? The country with the comparative advantage in all of these goods. And, of course, it also gives us an idea about the gains from trade. The, that scale, the size of the gains that can be made by Scotty mowing the lawn instead of the beefster. Now this model is really simple, it's very stylized, uh, but even in um, modern trade theory, the Ricardian model is still used uh, because it really does provide some fundamental insights into the nature of international trade. Now in this course we're going to look at other models, <coughs> I guess more sophisticated models if you like, uh, but um, basically this model the, the, this initial model, the Ricardian model, gives us a really good basis around which to then build on that, which is exactly what we're going to do over the next few weeks. So this is one of those most remarkable results in economics, actually. It's one of the insights that, that economics has contributed, if you like, to, to society, to our understanding of knowledge. And the reason is, of course, is that it, it explains why that even if one country is more efficient than all other countries, it's still not in its own interest to produce all of these goods. In other words, even if one country has a lower opportunity cost, is better, is better at all of this than anyone else, then it's still not going to produce every single thing. So in other words, it can still gain by specialising and engaging in trade with other countries. So at the moment we're going to assume uh, we're not looking at international trade, so we're just looking at one country, we'll call that home. Uh, of course we've only got one factor of production and that's uh, labour. <coughs> and we're only producing two goods, wheat and yoghurt. We obviously want some concept of the, the labour productivity, which we define sort of in terms of the unit labour requirements of each good. And that's just simply the number of hours uh, of labour required to produce a kilo of wheat, which we do denote as this ALW, or a litre of yoghurt, ALY. In terms of the total production possibilities in this country, in other words, what's the maximum that we can produce? It's going to be defined by this equation here, where you've got the unit requirements, how many hours it takes, multiplied by the quantity of wheat that you make, plus the unit requirements for a litre of uh, yoghurt, multiplied by how many units of yoghurt, and that of course has to be at least equal to or less than the total labour supply available. You obviously can't produce more than what you've got in terms of labour hours in total. So let's have a look at this in terms of a diagram. Note we've got uh, we're looking at the production of the goods. So we've got yogurt on one axis, wheat on the other. We could flip that around; it doesn't really matter, okay? But once you stick, once you've got one, remember you've got to stick to the same thing for consistency. The same you've got to have yogurt on one axis, wheat on the other. So let's assume we've got in total we've got a thousand hours available. So that L on the previous slide is equal to a <coughs> thousand. Sorry. Uh, further assume it takes one hour to produce a kilo of wheat, but two hours to produce a litre of yoghurt. So we can show this on our production possibilities diagram, and all we need to do is say, right, so what if we spend all of our labour producing yoghurt, 1,000 hours, takes two hours per litre, so at most we can produce 500 litres. Another way of expressing that is simply 1,000 divided by the unit requirements, two hours. Yep. Do the same thing for wheat. It's a thousand hours, an hour to produce a kilo of wheat, so we can produce at most a thousand uh, kilos of wheat. Again, the, labor the total labour supply divided by the unit requirements of wheat. Join the dots. Okay. So that, this gives us our production possibilities. Uh, it's linear at the moment. We don't have anything, um, we're not saying anything here about changing opportunity costs. It is straight linear in that it is, you know, uh, for every two hour, to, uh, two hours to produce a litre of um, yogurt, you could produce um, two kilos of wheat, okay? Or to produce a litre of yogurt, you can produce two kilos of wheat, okay? So the slope is constant. 
All right. In order to produce one more kilo of wheat, we would have to give up one on AOY or alternatively half a liter of yogurt. Yeah. In that way, then we can the slope of this if you like, or the way that we express it, it's not strictly slope because it's not rise over run, but um, the formula, if you like, that we use for this is just the relative labour requirements, unit labour requirements, yeah? And that's the opportunity cost. So here, of course, that's going to be, sorry, I'll go back to there, that's obviously going to be one over two or a half, yeah? So that defines this opportunity cost. Let's talk about prices. At the moment, all that we've done is introduce the actual production of it in terms of the you know, how many hours we need to produce these. Now, if there's only one factor of production in this model, then it simply means that labour gets all the income from the production of the goods. There's no splitting between capital um, or profits or anything like that. So in other words, the, the labour will receive, if you like, all of the price of the goods. So if we define the unit price of wheat as PW and PY, the unit price of yogurt, the hourly wage, we want to express this in, in a common term if you like, is the price of wheat divided by the hourly requirements to produce a kilo of wheat, and the same for yogurt, PY over ALY. Just a quick example. Uh, so if the price of wheat is $3, uh, well, if it's three, oh, this is terrible, I don't know why I'm doing this, $3, and it takes one hour. Okay, so it's three dollars an hour for the yogurt. The price is actually eight dollars. Unit requirements are two. Oh, so that, you're gonna have to get used to my rubbish writing here as well. Is the equivalent of four dollars an hour. I'm even gonna try and do a dollar sign. That's stupid. There we go. All right. Now, if you're a worker, based on these numbers here, three dollars an hour or four dollars an hour. Workers are obviously going to prefer to produce yogurt, so the country is going to specialise in yogurt, at, given these numbers. Okay. More generally, though, what we want to look at is this: is the relative um, uh, prices and the relative unit costs. So basically, here wages in the wheat sector are going to be high if the relative price. Now, this is this bit's important. We're going to look at relative prices a lot in this course. So in other words, the price of wheat divided by the price of yogurt. If the relative price of wheat is greater than the relative factor uh, unit labour requirements, the ALY, uh, ALW over ALY, then uh, the wages are going to be higher in the wheat sector. Conversely, if the relative price of wheat relative to yogurt is less than those labour requirements, the relative labour requirements, then the wages in the yogurt sector are going to be higher. This is just basically um, moving around the terms from the previous slide. So a country will specialise in the production of wheat if the relative price of wheat is greater than the opportunity cost of producing it. Okay. So if the relative, we got the, if this is a half, yeah, the one over the two, then if the relative price of wheat with respect to yogurt is greater than uh, a half, then the country will specialise in production of wheat. If they want to make both goods, and remember we don't have trade here at the moment, so you would imagine that um, both goods would want to be produced, what you're going to get is an equality in terms of these two things. In other words, the relative prices need to equal the relative opportunity cost of producing those goods. So in the absence of international trade, the relative prices of goods will equal the relative unit labour requirements. So that's fine. That's that's the adjustment of prices, etc., to um, to ensure, if you like, that both goods are going to be made. So what we want to do again, we're not talking about trade here. But we want to look at this in terms of a basic supply curve. Now this is a different supply curve than what you might say see in micro or anything like that because what we've got here is, note what we've got on the vertical axis, we've got the relative price of wheat. We are looking at wheat overall, so we've got the quantity of wheat on the um, uh, horizontal axis. So we're focusing on the issue of wheat and the supply of wheat, but we're looking at relative prices. Why do we do that? Well, basically, you know, it, it kind of just allows us to look at the, the two markets on the one diagram. Yeah, because we're, we're 
implicitly or explicitly, I guess, incorporating the issue of the price of yogurt within this diagram by looking at the relative price rather than just the absolute price of, of wheat. So at this price here of a half, which remember is equal to the uh, opportunity cost here, you can see we've got a perfectly elastic or a horizontal supply curve. So if the price is equal to half, then you're going to produce some wheat and some yogurt. Remember that's the equality between the if the relative price is a half is equal to this, then you're going to produce both goods. Now we don't know based on this how much of each is going to be produced because what we're lacking, of course, in this diagram is any understanding of demand. Now we'll bring that in later in one of the subsequent videos, but at the moment we're just focusing on supply. So it'll be somewhere between here and here. Now what happens here is that this is our maximum um, amount of wheat that we can produce. And it's 1,000 hours, which will produce 1,000 kilos of wheat. And you note that the supply curve goes from being perfectly elastic, if you like, to being perfectly inelastic. And the reason, of course, is that if the price does go above the half, you're going to specialise in wheat. So in other words, you're going to only produce wheat. But that 1,000 is a, is a constraint. You, you physically can't produce more than that 1,000, given the, given the labour supply that you've got. So any changes in price, in other words, any increase in price, can't be reflected through higher supply of wheat because you've reached the maximum. Yeah? So if the relative prices go up and up and up, it doesn't matter. You, as long as it's greater than half, you're going to be specialising in wheat, and the fact that the price goes up by more is immaterial in terms of the production, the physical production of wheat because you've reached your maximum. So that uh, is just a very brief, very brief introduction to this. What we're going to do subsequently, we're going to uh, introduce demand and we're going to look obviously at international trade or trade between partners in terms of uh, this basic Ricardian model.